Hey, hi. Thank you for clicking on this video. Uh, I've been told that the first minute is quite important for viewer retention, so I'll quickly introduce myself. My name is Shitaj. I work as a firmware engineer at an industrial IoT company in Pune. I am a batch of 2025 graduate. I have done my bachelor's in electronics and telecommunications engineering. Although I have been working since the end of my third year, so my corporate years of experience does come out to be a year and a half at this point, right? Uh, let me set the context for this video, like Harki Rath says. Uh, the reason I'm making this is because uh, I've been talking about Emirates software and Emirates systems, you know, on LinkedIn, on Twitter, in real life for quite a while now and a lot of my juniors including some of you guys have been constantly asking me that how do we get into what you do right and i've been telling them you can do this you can do that you can do this you can do that but i've never made a comprehensive guide or a collection of my thoughts that i've been trying to tell them right so this video is an attempt at that uh, again a little bit of a disclaimer i'm not claiming that this is the definitive guide to getting into my merit systems and merit software. However, what I'm saying is this is how I have done it. This is a guide to getting into merit systems and merit software, right? Uh, with that being said, I would like to uh, give a short disclaimer, uh, short clarification, or a short uh, you know view of my college career. Uh, the reason why I am into embedded systems the reason why i'm working as a firmware engineer right now is because of my college's robotics team called team automatons uh, from pccoe pune right we take part in a competition called as abu robocon uh, we even did you uh, know stood ar2 in i believe 2024 right i've been a part of this team for three years my first year second year and third year right and uh, this team is the reason why i have my career right now okay uh, why do I say that? Well, this team not only gave me a direction, it gave me resources, the resources being hardware, you know, a microcontroller, sensors, motor drivers, motors, mechanisms, right? And the freedom to fail and the freedom of time to come to the team and work and learn and implement and fail and break things. Uh, so the disclaimer or no, the reason why I'm talking about it right now is because I want to let you guys know I did not do what I have done by sitting in a room in front of a computer or by just reading books and taking notes. I did this by opening the, the lab of my team at 7.30 a.m. Sitting there in the lab, learning, building, breaking, experimenting, failing all throughout the day till about 1 a.m. in the night by going back to my room, my hostel room, till about 2 to 30 a.m., sleeping, waking up at 6.30, 7 o'clock in the morning, only to come back at 7.30 the next day, opening the, the lab's lock and doing it all over again. So this is the type of, uh, you know, dedication that it took me to get to where I am right now, right? With that being said, uh, I would classify the things that someone needs to learn to get into embedded systems into six major categories, right? And I will uh, elaborate every single category as we go, as we speak. The very first or the very primary one being the C language. What a shock. <laughs> what, a, what, a, what a surprise, right? But no, uh, in, all due, in all, all due seriousness, uh, C language is the base on which the entire embedded world stands on. Right, you cannot get into embedded software or embedded systems if you don't know C language and at a pretty good level. Right, you have to have a very strong understanding of things like pointers, things like memory management, things like space complexity, things like time complexity, things like uh, you know, structs, enums, uh, you no, know, what is a packed structure, uh, things such as story specifiers, things such as. Uh, I, like I don't know there's there's a whole lot of things right uh, you can get the detailed list I will provide a link uh, that you know has all the things that are considered important in the C language for embedded systems uh, there's a subset of these topics which people collect together and call it as embedded C you might have come across the term somewhere people confuse embedded C to be a specific language it's not it's just C language that is being used in a uh, 
I shouldn't say different way, but in a non-conventional way. Like the normal software guys don't really understand that Emirates C is just C language being used in a different way. That's the the best way I can put it. Right. The second uh, thing would be DSA. Keep in mind, I'm not saying a particular language, but I'm referring to the concepts of DSA. Listen, the whole point of DSA was to efficiently manage data, right? So that it can consume less memory and it can work faster. Well, uh, these are the two things that are of paramount importance in embedded software as well, on embedded systems as well. Why? Because more often than not, you are working in a resource constrained environment. You don't have eight gigabytes of RAM. You don't have two terabytes of storage. You'll probably have some kilobytes of RAM uh, God help you if you don't have any storage, you might have a EMMC that's of 4 GB or 8 GB or 32 GB at the most. You might have a clock speed of around 168 uh, you know, kilohertz as the case being in an STM32 F407, which is the board I've worked with a lot, but I digress. My point is you don't have a lot of computational resources available to you. Therefore, whatever software you're building, whatever things you're writing has to run in the most efficient way from a, from a space complexity perspective and a time complexity perspective as possible, right? And this is where a good command of DSA of how to use arrays or I should say when to use arrays, when to use linked list, when to use a stack or a queue, right? This is where all of it comes in. So keep in mind, uh, DSA is really, really important for embedded software as well. Some people make that mistake of not being well versed with, uh, you know, how does exactly a data structure work under the hood? Don't make that mistake. It's quite important, right? The third thing is object oriented programming. And the best example of OOP being used in the context of an embedded software is the Arduino language. If you, you know, take a deep look into the files of the Arduino IDE, you will find nothing but two things, C and C++. However, the way that they have architected their entire IDE, their entire libraries is the best example that I can give of object oriented programming being used in embedded software. Keep in mind, while designing an embedded system, you have to assume that the user is A, stupid, B, is always trying to break the memory of whatever processor that you're using, right? Therefore, as a, as a software engineer, it is your job and your duty to abstract the hardware away from the user. Don't let the user application interact directly with the hardware. Let it interact with the hardware through some sort of abstraction. If this sounds familiar to you, congratulations, you know how object oriented programming works, right? Industry standard software, especially for embedded, embedded systems has always been written and will always be written using object oriented programming. Why? Because companies would like to abstract their actual hardware from the user. Therefore, if you are a student who is willing to work into embedded software and the embedded industry, keep a good command of object oriented programming as well. Cool. Moving on. The fourth thing would be electronics. CS and IT guys who are watching this video, please uh, don't click off and don't run away. What I mean is uh, you are a software developer, but you are writing software, which is going to directly interact with the hardware. There are no abstractions. There are no safeguards or rules. You are being given a processor, which is naked and your code has to run on it. The reason why I say electronics is a, a must for getting into embedded software is that it is always better to understand what you're writing the software for. In this case, you're writing software directly for the registers of the processor. So it becomes important to understand what type of flash memory is being used, what type of, uh, you know, how does a, a transistor work? How does a BJT work? How does a MOSFET work? What are the switching applications? Uh, you know, how does the electronics behind the system that you're writing software for? How does that work? Why? Because you are writing software to optimize the electronics that are, that are present in your system. Right. So a basic understanding of 
analog and digital electronics goes a long long way in you being a good embedded software developer or an embedded software engineer or a firmware engineer i hope this does make some sense if it doesn't comment down below i will gladly you know help you out and answer as many questions of you as possible right the fifth thing is computer architecture this is a non negotiable if you are working or if you are willing or if you are wishing to work as an embedded software engineer you have to be well versed with things like the arm cortex architecture uh again it starts very basic with the 8 bit 8051/8086 microcontroller slash microprocessor architectures it starts from there then you graduate to cortex m0 cortex m3 cortex m4 cortex m4 should be good enough for you to get a job as a fresh college grad however if you are a little crazy like me you can go and you know, go on and read how does the cortex a architecture work cortex a53 which is the processor that is being used in a raspberry pi right what do i mean by architecture uh, that might be a question that you know pops into your head uh, i will leave this as a, as like an assignment to to the viewer uh, do google cortex a53 architecture document details and uh, see like see uh, you know the 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 links that that you that you find the pdfs that you find because be prepared to have your mind blown away right this moment that i'm talking about right now when i went and actually looked at the cortex m m3 architecture which was the first time i actually opened something from arm i will remember that moment till the day i die why because at that moment i knew that this is what i want to do for the rest of my life and i want you guys to have that moment as well computer architecture basically means the internals of your processor right how does every single peripheral fit into a chip that is this big how is the clock being supplied how does the power you know get distributed how, where are the registers how do they work how does the memory work how does the you know interaction happen between electricity that is the power that is the clocks and the bits of the software that you are writing i know i'm getting off track a bit that's just because there's so much going on through my mind right now right but yeah long story short computer architecture is of paramount importance and i will leave this as an assignment to you guys do go and read uh, you know the architecture of a cortex m3 or a m4 processor and be prepared to have your mind blown away right and the last thing the sixth thing that is really important for embedded systems is operating systems it can be either embedded linux or real time operating systems see what happens is as you keep working with more powerful processors you can you cannot just write a while one loop that has all the code that you want uh, you know to execute on your processor right the processor becomes so powerful that it can run a thousand such infinite loops at the same time therefore you need some sort of operating system that can interact with every single you know every single uh, signal that the processor receives it can that can you know schedule the time for execution for every single one of these signals and uh, the point i'm trying to convey is at a certain point the processor becomes so powerful that simple software cannot fully harness the power of the processor that you have therefore you need something that is an operating system which can take the different tasks that you want to perform on your processor and can then interact with the actual hardware of the processor in order to schedule everything and run everything smoothly i hope that makes a little bit of sense right so these are the six things that are required i'll summarize every single one of them uh, you have c language brackets embedded c you have dsa the you have object oriented programming uh, keep in mind i'm not saying c++ or java i'm referring to the concepts of object oriented programming you have electronics digital and analog you have a uh, computer architecture really really important and the sixth thing you have uh, linux uh, as or as i should say you have operating systems it can either be real time operating system rtos or linux your choice These are the six things that I did, which you know got me a job as an embedded software engineer and then a firmware engineer. Uh, technically, this should be the end of the video. 
I don't know how to edit videos. That's why I'm doing this in in a single take. I do apologize if I did go off course somewhere here and there. If you have made it to this point of video, uh, just drop a comment. Let me know that you have actually watched the hell that I have to say, right? And uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to comment. I will make sure that I answer to as many of them as possible. And uh, yeah. I guess this should be a good starting point for anyone who wishes to get into embedded systems and embedded software. I will keep on talking about my experiences as you know time passes as I get better at making videos. I know I'm not uh, no this is not a really professional video is it? Uh, the script has been all over the place this that and the other blah blah blah. But yeah, if you have made it to this point of video of the video, please drop a comment and let me know. And yeah, I'll see you next time.